purpose number four. Uh, purpose number four, it helps us to prioritize the issues in our own life. And I thought, I've never done this before, and it would be probably a little bit uh, tedious, but what do you think about keeping a prayer journal and just writing down, here's all the things I prayed about this week. And at the end of the week, look back at, and look at it. What does, that, what does that list start to look like? Does it start to, we start seeing all the things I've asked for, and we start at, well, I see a lot of me's and my's and, and, and things that are involving me, and, and a lot of them are involving my life, and, you know, I want more, I want more money, I want an easier life, I want, I want to have this, I want to have a solution to this problem, God fix this for me, fix that for me, whatever it might be. Well, what was Paul's focus when he prayed? Um, Look over at Colossians chapter 1. We're, I'm going to read a couple of these. We don't have to read all of them, but they're right together. In Colossians chapter 1, in fact, I think we will read all three of them. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. Notice what he says. Paul talking to the Colossians here, he says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. Now let's flip over to chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. It says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in, with th- uh, in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on, a ma- uh, on account of which I am in prison. Let's flip over a couple more pages over to 1 Thess- Thessalonians chapter 3. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 9 through 13. Paul writes... Um, for what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see your face and, uh, and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our ways to you and, make the Lord, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all that we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Does that sound like our prayers? It should. You know, it's very easy for us when we think about prayer. And the world does this a lot. Um, We think about prayer in terms of our immediate needs, the things in front of us, the things that we can see. Let's go back to that very beginning, the whole purpose of prayer. One of the things that is is supposed to remind me of my relationship to God, I am the servant of God. God is not the servant of me. And if I am aligning my thoughts and my ideas with what God wills and what God wants to establish in this life, shouldn't my prayers start to focus on what God wants? Now, that's not to say that we don't have things that we ask for that are physical in nature. And certainly, there's a lot of things to pray for, a lot of difficulties and a lot of things that we want to ask. But Paul spends almost all of his time in prayer on these spiritual things and the spiritual needs. Do we pray for people to increase their faith? Do do we pray to people, do do we pray for the church? How much time do we spend praying for this church to grow? And not just in number. Number would be great, but do do we pray for each other spiritually? Do we pray for individually, knowing that each of us have different challenges that we go through, including myself, uh, that, that, that we have to deal with, and we think about, God, help this person to be your child and your servant in the best way to overcome this obstacle. Help them to grow in this area. Help them to strengthen. Help them to help others. You know, are we thinking about the health of this church in our prayers? And how much time do we spend on it? How specific do we get? Is that something we care about? You know, the reality is that, you know, we, we pray about what we care about. I mean, that's just, I, I don't know that there's any debate about that. If I look back at that prayer list, I can probably give you an idea of what is on my mind during that week, isn't it? Those are the things that are important to me. Those are the things that matter to me. Is the church on that list? Is the work of God on that list? Are my brothers and sisters' spiritual well-being on that list? Prayer ought to drive me in that direction. It ought to be, you know, Paul talks about our spiritual growth and faith and knowledge, the the physical and spiritual well-being of others, the work of the church and the furtherance of the gospel, that God's will be done in our lives and his work. These, These things go over and over and over in the prayers that we read in the New Testament. We need to have those things reflected in our own prayers as well. 
Um, James 4, 2 through 3, talks about the idea of praying from a physical impulse. You ask and you receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it on your own lusts. You're just praying for the here and now. You're just reacting. You know, you have a need, you have an impulse, and you pray about it. And then when God doesn't solve it in the exact way in the time that you want, you think that your prayer has been unsuccessful. Because when we align ourselves with God's, God's ideas and what God wants and what God's prayer is, there's a, over in Jeremiah chapter 39, or 29, excuse me, this is, a, this is a passage all of us have heard. We've all seen it on bumper stickers. We've all seen it on um, posters and, 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 and tchotchkes in, in people's homes. And it is probably, you know, right up there with Matthew 7. It's one of the most misused passages in all the Bible. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 23 or 29, I keep getting it wrong. Um, I'm going to read this in, in context, because first of all, we're going to see what this passage is really talking about. But second of all, there's a part that gets left out of this equation that I think is pretty important. Jeremiah 29, verses 10 through 14. It says, For thus says the Lord, Seventy years are completed for Babylon. I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations in all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. You know, the world takes that little section out of it. And so, see, God has an individual plan for each and every one of us, and every one of those plans has to do with me having everything I want. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be successful. I'm going to be important. I'm going to, be, I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to do all this. And God has something special in mind for me. Now, that may very well be true, but that's not what this passage is talking about. You know, first of all, it's talking about the idea of the children of Israel being brought out of Babylonian captivity and that God has a specific plan to do them good, not only in the short term, but in the long term through the revelation of Jesus Christ. But notice what gets missed in there. It kind of gets tucked away a little bit. Um, let's see now. This is the problem with this Bible. It's got very small text and now I lose where I am. There it is. Um, down in verse 12. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when? When you seek me with all your heart. That's when God's going to listen to you. When I'm seeking God with all my heart. And what that means is that I'm, t I'm going to God and saying, God, I want what you want. I want to be pleasing to you. I want to bend my will to your will. It's not God, give me this, give me this, give me this, or God, make me important, or God, make me matter in some way. It's God, make me a servant in your kingdom in whatever way you see fit. That's what Jeremiah 29 is talking about. So the question is, are my prayers reflecting a spiritual life or carnal life? Do I pray like somebody who's embedded in here is not going anywhere anytime soon, or do I pray like someone who has my eye on something else? It's very easy for us to get comfortable in this life and to start thinking that the, the, the immediate cares of the day are the things that are important to us. 